All right, I'd like to welcome the Seville Singers up. And we're going to go into our hymn. But before we do that, I'd like to um, open in prayer. Lord, just thank you for today. And thank you for letting us be here and being able to worship with you and letting you into our church. Um, Lord, I pray that you bless this service today and you bless the people that are in here. You know what they're going through and you know what they need. Um, let this be a light on their day. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much. Today's scripture is going to come from Jude, the letter we've been studying. We took a little bit of a break, and we're going to jump back into Jude today, so I, I wanted to share the scripture with you. Uh, it's going to be Jude. Uh, there's only one chapter in Jude, so Jude verses 5 through 7. Uh, say this, it says, Now I want to remind you all, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. May the Lord add his blessing to the scripture reading this morning. We can have all the kids that want to come up to the front row. Uh, come on up if you'd like to and join uh, myself and Pastor Autumn. We can clap for them as they make their way up. Did you guys find all the Easter eggs last week? You sure? I think I stepped on one on the way in this morning. But it was plastic, so it's okay. Well, welcome to church this morning. You know, I am still coming down from Easter, and I don't want to come down. Last week is my favorite week in the entire Christian calendar. You know why? Guess. Yes. Because Jesus raises from the dead. How about we clap? That's awesome. That's a exact, that's the right answer. But it's the whole week. It's the whole week leading up to the empty tomb. We celebrate Monday, Thursday. We remember the last supper Jesus had with his disciples. And then we uh, remember Good Friday. And our hearts are heavy. Uh, Good Friday happens. Jesus is nailed to a cross and we're reminded it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. You know that sermon uh, is one of my favorites. And then we celebrate Easter morning, and we had a breakfast. I think uh, Chris and Kay and all them made about 7,000 pancakes and 700 dozen eggs and all kinds of sausage. Maybe not that many, but it, we didn't run out of food. It was like feeding of the 5,000. It just kept coming and coming and coming. But uh, I want to stay in the Easter vein a little bit. Any idea... Why do we have church on Sunday? I mean, who picked who picked Sunday? I mean, honestly, like Sunday, day of rest, day of rest. Good answer. That's usually the Sabbath. That's Saturday. So the Jewish people, even Jesus, recognized Saturday as the day of rest. But who picked Sunday? Why do we celebrate every Sunday morning? Yes. Yes. Jesus rose on Sunday, didn't he? We found the empty tomb on Sunday at the beginning of the week. We know the Jewish people couldn't do anything on Saturday. And Sunday, there was a party. It was a great time. The tomb was empty, so for 2,000 years, Christian brothers and sisters kept meeting every Sunday morning. Why? To celebrate the empty tomb, right? So we actually celebrate the empty tomb every single Sunday, and we've been doing it for a long time. That's important. Now, can you have a church service on, say, Wednesday? Absolutely not. That's it. No, I'm just kidding. You can. 
You absolutely can. You can have it on Saturday night. You can have it on Thursday morning. You can have it whenever, but you're still doing what? celebrating the empty tomb right so tradition tells us that we've been doing uh, Sunday morning services for a long time to help us uh, be reminded of the empty tomb but let's say uh, you're a healthcare worker and you can't get to church on Sunday because you're taking care of everybody it's okay we can celebrate the empty tomb all the time in fact we're going to learn more about how the Bible says every day is celebrating the empty tomb but that's how we ought to live our lives you're going to go back with Autumn and learn more about that. Before I let you go, can I pray with you? Let's pray for our youth. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity just to learn a little bit more about what your word tells us. To be reminded of the empty tomb, not just on Easter, but every single day of our lives. Father, would you make that applicable to each and every one of our lives today? We pray for our youth that you will continue to surround them and protect them, help them to grow into strong individuals who love you and seek after you, who are restless until they find their rest in you, Father. It's in Jesus' name we ask these things. And the entire church said, amen. amen. All right. I know elements of that are graphic. We see the nail driven into the hands. But crucifixion is graphic. Up until the movie came out, The Passion, we kind of drifted away from just exactly what the sacrifice was and what it meant. We need to be reminded of that. We are jumping back into our uh, sermon series as we go through this little tiny book called Jude that is right before the book of Revelation. And we've established that it's a very small book like a lot of other books in our New Testament it's a letter it's a letter written as the church is being established in that area in that Palestinian area and we know that the Greek the Greek is very uh, uh, well written and we know that it was probably written uh, to a Greek audience. Jude is the writer. Church tradition tells us that Jude is the writer, and Jude is the brother of James. James is the biological brother of Jesus. Yes, Mary and Joseph went on to have other children. It's in Scripture, all throughout Scripture. James, we know, historically, went on to start the first church of Jerusalem. He was martyred there. They threw him off the tower for his faith. And we know initially his brothers didn't really believe that Jesus was who he said he was. Remember, they actually went to go get him. And Jude is the little brother, no doubt younger than James. So Jude, who wrote this letter that we're studying, was a biological brother of Jesus as well. Jude was probably written in the early to mid-80s, not the 1980s, although that was a cool time. The 80s, the 80s, like at the first century, within the first 100 years, in the 80s. And, and we think uh, that because we know Jesus was born around 4, crucified around 33. This would give the church time to expand and become established. And uh, so that puts us right around the 80s. Now, <clears throat> this letter is written as a caution to the church to guard herself against something that was happening all around them. Now, things that I think still plague the church today. Jude wants to encourage the church, but also tell the church to be on guard, uh, to check ourselves against the map so we don't stray from the path. That's what Jude is. Jude is fighting against false teachings and things like that. So I say this because Jude is a mature letter to an established church. I wouldn't go through Jude if I didn't think we were mature enough to go through Jude. So this isn't a letter to the world. This is a letter to those Christians, those people who proclaim to follow Christ that's who this letter's uh, to. Now, last time we were in Jude, which again, 
It was a couple of weeks ago. We paused, obviously, for Easter. And then before that, our brother Scott shared the uh, message of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem called Palm Sunday. Um, but the last time we were in there, Jude was telling the motivation for his letter that certain people had crept into the church unnoticed. The people were perverting the idea of God's grace, and we talked about that a little bit. We see it today with hyper grace, where everything is gracey, gracey, nice, and uh, do anything. We call them sometimes carnal Christians. Uh, you know, uh, they can leave the church parking lot and honk and uh, flip off a driver on the way out, right? They, they've already checked the box. The Christian thing to do was go to church that Sunday. They did that. Those are carnal Christians, and they're covered by God's grace. And that's all they, they uh, proclaim. The knee-jerk reaction to that is legalism. We looked at the, the pendulum swinging the other way. Remember I said that uh, we don't uh, smoke, we don't chew, and we don't go with girls that do, right? We don't dance, we don't do movies, we don't do anything that could give the impression that we're not pure. That's the extreme. That's the knee-jerk reaction. We shouldn't be at either one to be somewhere in the middle understanding God's grace covers it all and understanding that we are separated as we grow in our relationship with Christ now that was what we looked at last time Jude Jude today is going to remind us that Christians or Jesus followers of what we already know or perhaps what we already should know or maybe we knew at one time we need to be reminded of this let's look at that a verse at a time Uh, uh, Jude 5 says this now I want to remind you although you once fully knew it that Jesus who saved a people out of the land of Egypt afterward destroyed those who did not believe I want to remind you of something you once fully new remind you I want to bring you back to something that you know to be true and perhaps forgot now some things some things are hard to forget riding a bicycle you heard that saying it's like riding a bicycle once you learn how to ride a bicycle you never forget or, or roller skating or, or picking a guitar or piano a song that you've done a lot before uh, a lot of time can pass, and you can pick it back up and, and, and pick it up and do that. Or, or like long division, not long division, that, that we jettisoned a long time ago. That's hard to, hard to remember. But those things I described, skating, riding a bike, uh, song, piano, uh, those, those are great muscle memories. It's hard to forget those kinds of things because our brains don't have as much to do with those types of memories, uh, as our muscles do. You know, if you're a musician and you've ever picked a guitar or played the piano, sometimes you just need to do it, to, to get it, and, and you'll remember, oh, yep, I know how this goes, and, and you can go to town with it, or like I said, riding a bike or something like that. Now, there are ideas, those are muscle memories, ideas and thoughts that are solely ideas and thoughts much harder to remember. Much harder to remember. Studies show this all the time. Uh, Things like long division, tough to remember, right? Things like the formula to solve for X, the thing that you didn't use until your kids were in school, and you had to quickly educate yourself on how to do this because, God forbid, you look foolish in front of your elementary student. I've been there many times, and I thank God for YouTube for the refreshers on that or or how about this how to reset the clock in your car the time change comes and you go man i haven't done this for an, almost uh, uh, six months and i i cannot for the life of me figure this these are ideas that are solely uh reliant on on our brains to memorize how to do those things and those are hard to remember now However, if our thoughts and ideas evoke feeling, we immediately remember them in the future. If those thoughts and ideas evoke feeling, we can recall them in the future. You know what I'm talking about. 
uh, thoughts and ideas can be cemented in this way through our senses, through our uh, sight, our ability to see, hear sound, touch, smell, taste. Those things uh, can bring back memories. I know when I, when I smell onions cooking, I'm immediately taken back to my grandparents' house. I'd walk in and I could smell that. They put onion in a lot of things and I could smell it. It, it takes me back there to this day. Or, or a cold rain down the back of my neck. It takes me back to being in the service and those long road marches. Or, or hearing a song. Like in my family, we have summer songs. We have songs that we crank up in the car. And they bring me back, when I hear those songs years later, they bring me back to that summer. Uh, whether we uh, got to go to Disney or, or do something fun, uh, we attach a song to it, and that becomes the anthem or the thing that brings up that memory. We attach feelings to our memories. We cement them that way. Now, in our relationships, we sometimes need to be reminded of what we once fully knew. <clears throat> Life gets busy. Kids cry. Kids have practice. Bills need to be paid. Work needs to be done. They need you sometimes more than your family does. And we see a lot of marital problems develop. And sometimes we just need to pause and get back to what we once fully knew. Why did you marry her? Why did you marry him? Get back to the feeling that was invoked back then. We can stray from that sometimes, and to be honest with you, sometimes it's hard to recover the feeling. Sometimes it's hard when you're counseling uh, marriages uh, to go back. There's too much stuff that's piled onto it, but if we can get back, if we can get back to that feeling to uh, evoke uh, the memory, we're a pretty good place. But all relationships are like that. Go back to the feeling you had when Jesus forgave you. When you realized it. When you were filled with awe. Filled with wonder. You we're filled with this sense that your penalty was paid, but in shock that God would pay it for you because he loves you that much. We need to be reminded of that. We celebrate communion. Think about this, and we involve our senses. Why do we do this? Why do we do this? It reminds us of what Jesus did we use our uh, sense of taste, a touch. It's very tactile. The ceremony of, of communion is like that. We're involving our senses. It's not to feel good. It's not to uh, get together and have a little bit of juice and bread. It's to remind us of the very tangible way that Jesus paid for your sins. It involves our senses. When he says, do this in remembrance of me, he gave us a way to attach feelings to our memories. Let's get back to that. Coming right off of Easter is a great time to do that. That's part of this piece of scripture. The second part of this scripture says that Jesus saves, but also destroys. Jude is going to give us two examples that would remind the people reading this letter of this truth. The first one is going to be pretty familiar to us. The second one, the second one not so familiar, and it's going to take some unpacking, so we'll do that together. The first is the familiar one that Jesus, uh, who saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed those who did not believe. We are reminded of Passover. All the Hebrews who left were saved. Not everyone left. Remember, the Hebrew people were in captivity under the Egyptians. God went to war with Pharaoh, though it's not much of a contest. And he started to plague the people. 
and it was coming up to this last plague, he was going to take every firstborn male out of all the households, including the mangers. The firstborn male bull is going to die, the sheep, all of it. It's going to be mass destruction. But, but, if you exercise faith and you take the lamb and the lamb's blood and you cover the doorposts with the lamb's blood, with the blood of the lamb, the angel of death will pass over you and you will be saved. Not everyone did. Not every Hebrew person did. Some of them freely chose to stay. And we read and we think, why would, why would people do that? Well, let me remind you, you remember Katrina? Raise your hand if you remember Hurricane Katrina. It's one of the, the biggest natural disasters I was ever uh, alive to see and uh, kind of uh, see from a distance. And it didn't compute why it was so devastating until I actually went to New Orleans. And I was actually getting on a cruise ship in New Orleans, and we were looking down at the city. They were in a bowl. And I started thinking about Katrina and all the devastation. Did you know Katrina was the strongest hurricane ever recorded from the Gulf? Sustained winds of 175 miles per hour. The storm directly killed over 1,800 people. Now, on August 26th, warnings went out. In fact, it said this, urgent weather message. National Weather Service, New Orleans, Louisiana, 10, 11 a.m. Devastating damage expected, all caps. Hurricane Katrina, most powerful hurricane with unprecedented strength, rivaling the intensity of Hurricane uh, Camille, of 1969. Most of the area will be uninhibitable for weeks, perhaps longer. At least one half of well constructed homes will have roof and wall failure. All gabled roofs will fail. This is the National Weather Service. I'm reading from their warnings. Leaving those homes severely damaged or destroyed, the majority of the industrial buildings will become non-functional. Partial to complete wall and roof failure is expected. All wood-framed, low-rising apartments will be destroyed. Concrete block, low-rise apartments will sustain major damage, including some wall and roof failure. High-rise office and apartment buildings will sway dangerously, few to the point of total collapse. All windows will blow out. Airborne debris will be widespread and may include heavy items such as household appliances and even light vehicles. Sport utility vehicles and light trucks will be moved not may be moved, will be moved. The blown debris will create additional destructions. Persons, pets, and livestock exposed to the winds will face certain death. May is not in there at all. Power outages will last for weeks. Power poles will be down and transformers destroyed. Water shortages will make human suffering incredible by modern standards the vast majority of native trees will be snapped and un uprooted only the hardiest will remain standing but be totally defoliated few crops will remain livestock left exposed to the wind will be killed an inland in an inland hurricane wind warning is issued when sustained winds near hurricane force or frequent gusts of a, above hurricane force are certain within the next 12 to 24 hours. Once a tropical storm and hurricane force winds onset, do not venture outside. This is the warning given. Who would stay? I understand there's people that couldn't leave. 
I get that. There are people that couldn't leave. But who would read the warnings and not leave, if possible? Well, people did. People did. <laughs> We've weathered storms before. Hey, you guys are a lot of talk. These hurricanes are, you know, I got some plywood I'm going to put up. It's no big deal. That was the attitude until it made landfall. And when it made landfall, it was too late. It was too late. Back to our text. Who would stay during those plagues? Now, going back to Egypt in the Exodus, they just saw the river turn to blood. It rained frogs. You just suffered festering boils all over your body. And now this crazy Moses guy is back, and he said, God's going to kill all your firstborn males. Who in their right mind would stay? People did. People did. Jude is saying God has given lots of warning before destruction. He always does. He always does. He gives another example, and this second one we'll need to unpack a little bit. Let's look at this. In 6, he says, And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. We read that, and we're like, what is this guy talking about? Angels didn't stay in their own positions of authority. What's he mean? What is Jude referring to? What Jude is referring to, most scholars believe, what happened in Genesis 6. Let me read this to you. In Genesis 6, it says this, when, a, when man began to multiply on the face of the land and the daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive and they took as their wives any they chose. Well, then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward. When the sons of God came, to, came into the daughters of man, they bore them children. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. These were powerful men, almost demigods, if you were. Now, early church tradition, early Jewish tradition saw sons of God as angels. That was, that was the, the widely held interpretation of the people reading this letter. That when they read Genesis 6 and talking about angels mating with humans, that's what they were talking about. Later in the years, the church kind of went away from that interpretation, but it's a solid tr interpretation. And, and Jude is reminding us of this, that these sons of angels actually called principalities. The Greek word is ark, A, R-K. It's where we get the word archangel from. These archangels, 200 of them, the Bible tells us, came down and found women incredibly attractive. Early uh, Jewish tradition uh, ascribes our ability to use minerals like iron and make weapons of destruction to this event. It, it ascribes, it gives credit to this event when the angels dwelt with men. They also taught our women to shadow the eye, they called it, to be, ma, to be more attractive, to wear makeup, to be more attractive. That's not our focus today. But some believe that these mighty men came to be worshipped. Anything from Greek gods like Zeus and Hermes and all the like is very possible. But what Jude is doing here in our study is reminding his readers about something very important. The point, even angels do not escape the judgment that awaits them. Even angels, even archangels do not escape the judgment of God. They don't. And if they don't, how are you? How are you going to stack up? Archangels can't escape eternal chains. So he goes on and he adds Sodom and Gomorrah as a further example, as evidence. He says this, 
Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding city, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. That's a little more familiar to us. Sodom and Gomorrah uh, were filled with wickedness. Remember the story? Abraham's, son, or Abraham's nephew Lot lived in that region. God told Abraham, hey, I'm about to, I'm about to wipe out those cities. They are wicked. And, and Abraham says, whoa, 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 hold on a second, my, my nephew's there. Anyway, he intervenes for Lot. Two angels show up to Lot's house and say, hey, Lot, you need to come out of there. The people of the town see these attractive angels, and what do they want to do? They want to rape them. Abraham pulls them into their house. The people gather outside and say, you bring those you bring those beings out here. And then we read shockingly that Abraham's like, take my daughters. Don't touch these. The idea here is, is the sexual immorality runs across species. So the first example Jude gives is that the angels lusted after men. The second example he gives is that men are lusting after the angels. It's, it's an example that Jude is giving all to cement the point that angels can't get out of judgment and men aren't going to get out of judgment either. Nobody escapes the just judgment of God. Now, it's awesome to reflect and consider the sacrifice made before us, especially Easter, coming out of Easter. It's a huge deal. It's a huge deal that God went to great lengths in order for you to come to know his son. He went to great lengths so that you would know his love. It's hard uh, to know how great a thing you were saved to, which is God's love. We are saved to God's love without considering what we're saved from. Church, what are you saved from? What are you saved from? Evil? Demons? Satan? Like there's some kind of cosmic battle where uh, Satan might take over? Incorrect. You are saved by God from God. As we consider how big God's love is and understand the links he went to, so that we don't have to face eternal judgment, that he died on a cross. If he went to that length to save us from something, what we were saved from must be equally bad. If God's love is that big, his wrath is that big. And he doesn't want you to drink from that cup. He doesn't want you to drink from that cup. And we live in a society today, I'll be honest with you, we live in a society today, people don't want to hear it. People don't want to hear it. So this is what we do. This is the equivalent into running into a burning house. Your house is on fire, Mr. and Mrs. Neighbor, you should probably leave. That's a fire. <laughs> no big deal. Get out of my house. Get, get out of here. And we go, okay, I guess you're right. It's your house. It's your privacy. It's your rights. We'll just, just turn around and walk out. And Judah's saying, are you crazy? Pick them up. Pull them out of there. Get them out of the burning house. Are you kidding me? When did the church get to the point where it's like, okay, you're right. Uh, eternity's not that long. It's not a big deal. No. Now, our urgency needs to be one of get out while you still can. The warning signs are there. When Jesus returns, you'll know him. You'll know him. Everybody will know him. And if you didn't know him before, you ain't going to like him too much when he comes back. Because the time of salvation is now, isn't it, church? 
So Jude is reminding the early church, don't get soft. Don't be soft. We're on a mission here. This is time to go. It is go time. Think about this. I'll leave you with this. I'm, I'm running out of time here. Well, Think about this. When Jesus told Peter, when Jesus acknowledged Peter, when Peter acknowledged Jesus as Lord, Jesus said what? Jesus said, yes, you're right, Peter. And on this rock, on this truth, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Gates are not offensive weapons, are they? What is a gate used for? A gate is a defensive weapon. Jesus is saying, hell, hell has to put up gates to keep you folks from getting in there and taking people out. That's what the church is. This is an offensive move, not a defensive move. And Judah's reminding the church, don't get soft. Don't get all high up in your nice church buildings with your, your windows and your, your finances and your, your pastor and your worship music and all this kind of stuff. You're on mission. This is a rescue mission, and it's a violent one. It's an important one. There is not a higher calling this side of glory. And Jude is reminding the church of that. And if that don't make the hair on your neck stand up, that you get to be a part of that mission, then go back to the feeling. Go back and remember the feeling that you got when you realized what you were saved to because you knew what you were saved from. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity just to gather here. Father, as we consider the strong words in Jude, may you give us strength, wisdom, and courage to storm the gates of hell for someone we don't even know. To contemplate what eternity apart from you must be like so bad that you sent your only son to die a death that we deserve. May that uh, rekindle afresh a spirit in us where we don't want to see anybody fall to that fate. Give us the strength this day and always. It's in Jesus' name we ask. And everybody said, amen. All right, let's end this with prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for today, and thank you for allowing us to be here and um, learn more about you and worship you. Um, Lord, I pray for all the prayer requests that we have, all the unspokens, you know what they need, and um, just put your hand on their heart today. Um, I pray that everybody gets home saved and doing everything they need to do safely today. It's in your name we pray. Amen.